My name is Tim Almond. I am a graduate from Juniata College. My degree was in digital film and media. The media part is very broad for this reason because I get interested in a lot of different types of things, this being one of them. I graduated in 2009, and then I actually took a job at Penn State in 2010. I worked in the marketing department for housing and food services there, and I was the sole videographer, so I was responsible for constructing videos for housing and food services and posting them to YouTube, monitoring comments and posts and checking analytics and seeing what we can do to be better and to be more uh, efficient with our videos to get to our audience. So today, what I'm talking, going to talk to you about is actually how to craft a successful social media experience from your interests. So first, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the personal projects I've done. And I'm going to show you a few. Actually, I'm going to use two of them as prime case studies for a few topics I'm going to be talking about today. One is Small Imaginings, which is a blog slash website slash Facebook slash like everything you can be on Pinterest. And it's about puppets, which is one of my interests. Another thing I'm doing is called Small, or is called an Upside Down Umbrella. And that's about insects and photography, two more of my interests. Another thing that I did, and then failed at, and then left, is called Everything is Filmed, which was a semi-humorous blog spot blog about how my life, I related things that happened in my life through different films. So using internet memes based off of films, film clips, quotes, humorous, things like that. So if something happened in my life that I could connect to a film, I did. So that failed, and I left that. Uh, and again, I have multiple YouTube accounts, and I have multiple Facebook pages, I have multiple blog spots, I have multiple tumblers, I'm everywhere, I do everything, that's how you learn. So I'm actually going to show you a few things. First I'm going to start off with this first thing to show you that, look, I'm on Facebook. Um, you don't get to know about social media unless you're constantly doing social media. I just want you to know that I am on Facebook. There you go. And look, someone's already, look at that, I'm blowing up. Got one hit there. Um, so I'm going to talk about interests. I already named a few of my interests. Bugs, photography, film, puppets, animation is another one. So I want to talk about what is an interest and why it's important and why we're going to talk about them today. So first let's talk about what an interest is. I'm not talking about what you fill into your Facebook profile. Box, all right? You don't go in there, I like watching movies, I like reading, I like listening to music. Doesn't everyone, all right? I'm talking about specific interests. I like insects. That's weird. No one else in my life likes insects. That's very specific. Come on in. Is, is this a... No, never mind. We're doing a class. Sorry. Don't come on in. <laughs> Sorry about that. Have a great night. I don't know if I'm part of class. You can see some rest. Um... So insects, that's one of my interests. You know, that's not something that everyone's into. It's not something broad like watching movies or listening to music. So that's a very specific interest. I could, and I've combined it with photography. So insect photography, there you go. That's an interest. So that's what I'm going to be talking about today. And a little bit later on, I'm going to be asking you guys to write down some of your interests. And again, I don't want listening to music. I don't want watching movies or watching TV or reading books. If you're in the books, what kind of genre do you like? Is there a specific author? If you're listening to music, you only listen to hillbilly rock from X, Y years? That's good. That's an interest. Do you only like football players where their last name ends in Y? That's an interest. That's weird. That's an interest. All right, so that's what we're going to be doing today. In a little bit, I'm going to ask you just to write down a few, and we're going to go around and share them. I'm going to get to know some of your names and your interests, and just get a little bit, know a little bit more about you. So why is it important to know your interests? Well, it's important for your education. It's important for your career. It's important for the rest of your life. Because you want to follow your interests. You want to be an interesting person. You want to belong to a community. That's why we're on social media. I'm assuming everyone here is a part of some social media website. I'm assuming all of you are on Facebook, right? So everyone here is on Facebook? Let's say that. You're already a part of the community. And that means if you've been on Facebook for how many years now, you've been using Facebook for what? 
four, five years, six, seven. How long has Facebook been? Ten. Ten? Yeah. So you guys have been on Facebook for a while. So you've already made a community just by being on Facebook and just by liking friends. That's your community. Those are your friends. That's your community. But you probably have clicked. I like the movie Jurassic Park 3. You and however other thousands of people like Jurassic Park 3. You now belong to that community. Interests are important. Recognizing interests are important because you immediately belong to that community when you tell people on a social media page that you have that same interest. Now, why is it important to your education? Juniata, as you know, is a liberal arts school. They give you access to classes that you may not get access to at a bigger university. They may just tell you at a bigger university, you're doing video and film. You only can do video and film courses. You may get another course in here and there, another topic. You might not. Juniata, you're doing video and film? Great. What else do you want to do? You want to do insects? Great. You want to film insects? Great. Take science, take art, take theory, take anything that's in practical field, do it all. You know your interests now, and you don't have to, but you'll, you'll get them. But if you know them, follow them. I didn't know I liked insects when I went to school here. I would have taken science courses, but I didn't. I learned later on in life, and I thought, gee, I should have studied that in college. Take those opportunities, follow those interests. Now, why are your interests important to your career? When I got hired at Penn State, in my interview, I sent them a few of my YouTube videos of work that I did for Juniata when I worked in the marketing department. They clicked on that link and went to my other videos that I didn't want them to go to. They watched some of my animations, just really silly, stupid animations, 15 second long animations. I didn't think they were that great. In that interview, they told me, oh, can we look at this? Click, they pull up a video. I'm like, oh, you weren't supposed to see that. He said, we love it. We want you to do animations. That's part of the job part. If we have, so, we have a spot that needs to be filled, the previous person did animation, we want you to do animation. They didn't write it into the job requirement. They didn't. But they found one of my interests, animation, and that helped me get hired. Follow your interests. Now, I'm going to go around. I'm going to give you a few minutes. I want you to write down one to three specific interests. Get quick grab some paper. Or just Put them in your phone or your iPad, wherever you have. Just take a few moments here and write down one to three specific interests that you have that belong to you personally. That was interesting. Hi, Andy Wappiner. That's the hi, So when I start to see everyone's eyes, I'll know you're all done. So just give me a look, see, and then uh, move on, and we'll share some of your your interests. If you're struggling, write a more general one, and then that's actually a good place to start. But then you can get more specific by working from that general interest. So don't don't think too hard. You all know what your interests are. Just because I mentioned that you know everyone may have these bigger, broader interests doesn't mean you shouldn't write them down. I just want you to think a little bit about what your interests are. I want to get the thought process going on. And your interests now may not be your interest in a year, may not be your interest in five years, it may not even be your interest tomorrow. That's the great thing about interest is you move on from one to the next. They drive you from interest to interest. It's a weird, interesting path. Internet helps that. So everyone got a few down? Yeah, everyone's looking good? 
All right. Sort of, you can also do your presentation that you want to do um, in this format where you talk about your interest and how you establish social media. Um, how do you establish yourself and build a community using that interest? Um, so that's something else you can do as well. There you go. Good thought process. Get a little bit in class time work on the project. Yeah. All right. I'm going to start with you. When I go around you, we're just going to go around in a, this half circle here. I want you to say your name, <coughs> when you're going to graduate, what your POE is, because I'm just going to learn a little bit about you real quick, and then name your interest. <coughs> so, go ahead. My name is Abdullah al I'm going to graduate this May. Um, my POE is IT applications, and I only have two of them down, but I have attempting to make music on free loops, uh, audio editing software, and just video editing. Very cool. All right. Next. My name is Tessa Thomas. I'm going to graduate in 2014. My POE is instructional technology, and one of my interests is 80s movies. I love any of those movies. I just love all of them. And cows. I love cows. So that great specific interest. By the way, I'm not picking on you. Speak loud. Let everyone hear. I just, I just want to make sure. Yeah. No, it's all right. I just want everyone to be able to hear you because everyone has something interesting to say. Go ahead. My name's Janelle Howard. I'm a dual major in digital and creative art and communication studies, and I'm graduating in May. And my interests involve travel photography, photography and photojournalism. The color orange. Sunflowers and tobacco. Very cool. Next. I'm Dan. I'm uh, a few ways in the the arts and uh, <coughs> went to video games. <coughs> Stand up comedy and heavy metal. What was that middle one? Uh, video games, stand up comedy and heavy metal. Stand up comedy. There you go. Next. Okay. Uh, my name is Brian Trish. I will be graduating uh, 16. Uh, yeah. My interests are sports photography, uh, video art, and very cool. Next. Hey, um, last one is my name's Jamie McCarthy. I'm going to graduate from Point Two. I'm going to be an art team. And uh, so I'm just a uh, minimal photographer. So I'm going to be a minimal photographer. I'm going to be a minimal photographer. Great. I'm going to be a minimal photographer. Oh, it's all right. But I love mine. People now think of me as the bug guy. So it's, <laughs> and that's, that's a little bit weird that I play with bugs. So. Go ahead. Mine will probably talk everyone. Um, my name is Katie Pinkmeyer. I graduate in May, and I am interested in definitely going to Ireland. I will go something very interesting. Um, okay, this is going to sound really strange to you guys, but if I were really, really smart, you know, then my dog would be as much as I do. Um, exhumed bodies. I think it's fascinating. Here's why. Okay. Just let me explain real quick so you don't think I'm going to like be a great digger or anything like that. But I talked to a mortician, and they have exhumed bodies that were in the ground for 18 years, and if they have a really good ball, and like water does not get into the casket, they actually are very well preserved, and all that's on them is like this white, like gray dusting. You dust that off, and you look kind of. Okay. After 18 years. You know, that's, that's a specific interest. I just interest. think it's fascinating. What did you did you see the King Edwards? Yeah. Oh, it just found under a parking lot. Yeah. Under a parking lot. But anyway, I just yeah. So yeah, I find um, not that people in general, but people who have been buried for a long time get interesting, fascinating, and she looked like these. There you go. All right. Um, I'm Jack. My POE is multimedia communication. I'm going to graduate in uh, the semester, this semester after the semester. And um, one of my interests is uh, American Indian rallies. So. Okay, cool. Go ahead. Um, I'm, I'm a junior. I'm studying IT. And I have a bunch of interests, but some of them are art, physics, psychology, uh, skipping stones, and other There you go. All right, so keep these in mind. If you haven't written down, keep them in front of you, because later on we're actually going to do something with. So just kind of hold on to them, keep them in your mind. <laughs> so the last thing I'm going to say before we move on to some of my blogs is that your interests are actually what drive your social media experience. And you probably have already talked about what social media is. The big, the big thing social media can do for you is let you be a part of a community, like I've already said. So by recognizing your interests and being a part of a community, and, and you can contribute 
you can just consume or you can use it as a business model. There are several ways to interact, but your interests are important to driving your experience on the web. So I'm going to pull up my first example, which is an upside down umbrella. An upside down umbrella kind of came out of just this weird interest I started having in insects. Don't know why. Just, it kind of came into my life. I thought, wow, that's really cool. I want to find out more information. I'm a digital media artist. I work in video. I work in photography. I work in animation. I love that kind of stuff. So the natural inclination was to take photos of that. And I realized, that's awesome. It's such a small world. And just to view it on a much larger scale, these big pictures of such a small world, I thought it was very fascinating. So I made a blog. Actually, I made a Tumblr in which I take photos of insects that I see. And I'm just going to show you a few examples. This is a beetle, like I call it on the right. Actually, about 80% of these photos are taken with my iPhone. So I'm always on the go. The most easily carried camera is my iPhone. This is a camel cricket. These are some lady beetles, or ladybugs. Praying mantis. Praying mantis and my dog. I also pin them, and I collect them, and I put them up in a in a frame, like a shadow box. That's one of my hobbies as well. Uh -huh. Urban legend. There you go. Mm -hmm. They're not endangered. Uh, this is a, a wheel bug, a part of the assassin bug family. And then I also guest post, I guest blog, uh, or let some people guest blog on my my site. So this is an upside down umbrella. It started as a Tumblr, and in order to get more views, I brought it to Facebook. Also something that I don't have on here, every single time I blog on Tumblr, it not only goes to Tumblr, it goes to Facebook, it goes on Pinterest, it gets tweeted. That's the general progression of an individual post from, or from Tumblr. So. What I want to talk about using this website, the Tumblr, the Facebook, the Pinterest, all that is I'm just going to talk about a few general terms and ideas and thoughts that I've kind of come across and discovered and kind of worked on as I worked on this site. So using this as a case study, let's talk about what is its purpose for this exactly, for this purpose of having an upside down umbrella. Just a way for me to be creative. It was a way for me to share my interest with other people, tap into a community that existed, other people who liked insects, liked insect photography, found it interesting, didn't know anything about insects, but kind of like me, don't know where to start, don't want to seem weird. I'm just going to go to Tumblr, a very scientific light site, and I'm going to look at insects. That's what I wanted. That was my purpose, was to be creative, to reach out to a community that existed, and to be a part of it. And I was a part of that community by creating posts of my own. So your individual site, your social media experience, whatever you do on the web is going to fit one of these few purposes. It's going to be an interest of yours or someone else's. It's going to provide a service for you or for someone else. Or it could be a business. Now, like I said, this was an interest of mine. Something that provides a service, when I worked at Penn State, a lot of our websites and a lot of our Facebook was used for food services to tell people what they were serving in the different, the different outlets, the different cafeterias. That's a service. A business, if I started selling prints of my photos, it would become an interest, but it would become a business. I'm promoting my interest. I say I also do a craft, which is the photos. Would you like to buy it? That's a business. You can be a business and not sell anything on Facebook, but you can still be a business. Coca-Cola, they're on Facebook. Facebook is a business. In a weird way, it is. They sell advertising now. Um, any company you can think of, if they don't exist on social media, they're not doing it. They have to connect to people. Social media is what they use. So those are the three big things that I see social media serving, interests, service, and business. Now, when I started making this, like I said, I wasn't making it for 
my friends. Jigger, do you like insects? No. I have no interest in them. He has no interest in insects. Jigger finds them fascinating on no level whatsoever. But you like photography. You like Apple products. Yeah. So does it interest you to know that I'm taking wildlife photography with my iPhone? Look at that. I just connect with them on a level. A level. I have three interests combined together. Got two out of three. That's not bad. Um, but I didn't make it for Jigger. I made it for people who are interested about insects. So I found a niche market, and I went to it, and I found it. And that's what I'm working inside. The upside down umbrella is not for Jigger. It's not for my friends. It's not even for my family. My family thinks I'm weird. I did it for that specific market. So people are saying, why are you on Facebook? Because I'm trying to find other people. I'm trying to find that community. Where do they exist? What do they like? Can I get them to come to my page so they talk to me about insects? <laughs> in my own search across the web, I'm one person with an interest. It's very lonely. You don't think about lonely when you think about the internet. People make pages so that they're not lonely. People are going to come and comment. I get weird posts from friends who I didn't even know had an interest in insects. They just go, I thought of you. I found this really cool insect. I took a photo of it. I'm sending it to you. You thought of me when you thought of an insect. That's cool. So I'm creating a social experience that I'm molding to my interest. People now know that I love insects, and I get Christmas presents. I'm probably going to get birthday presents that are insect related. Um, I'm connecting with people who I have no idea who they are. People are just liking my stuff and starting a conversation. I'm creating, my, I'm creating my own social media experience by existing through this site, okay? taking my interest and creating a passion. So, so I, I also send you photos. I'll you know, tweet out or say, oh, you know, I saw this. Um, when I, whenever I see an insect, we have a couple other friends in common that also do that. But the, the other part that is, is to take note of is that uh, when you do that, even though it's a small community, people know you as the, the, the influential person in insects. So, Whenever I want to know something about an insect, I'm not going to go on the internet and look for something because I have, I'll have to put an effort into finding it, first of all. Um, whereas I can just go to Tim and say, hey, Tim, tell me more about this. You know, tell me more about skin bugs. And he'll, he'll know something about them and he'll tell me about them. Um, and I may, and not know, I may not know the answer, but I'll go look for it. But he'll go look for I'm it, whereas I, I could care less about going <laughs> and spending time to look for it. And I think that's what you do. You, you, you trust your friends perspective a lot more than you would with the internet, right? You don't, you, just, you go on a couple of different websites and they all say different things and you're still not sure. But if Tim said something, I'm more likely to believe him than I am those websites. So you're creating... I'm a very believable guy. I have a time. Right. So you create this, you know, you, you become influential in your own sort of... Interest. In your interest, yeah. You, you are essentially a knowledge base. People are coming to you. My friend, actually, who follows this post, who was a co-worker of my at Penn State, was reading my post. I had just done a post on the firefly, which you guys may not realize. The Pennsylvania firefly is actually our state insect. And it is a good trivia fact. My friend goes to trivia every night in State College, or every uh, week and at autos. That was a question. What is the state insect? And he just goes, I just saw this on Tim's blog. Pencil it's the Pennsylvania firefly. It's a firefly. And he, they got it. And they, I don't know if they won that night, but hopefully they did. I like to think they did based off of my knowledge. So, so that, yeah, that's, that's a great point. You are, when you start, when you invest yourself in an interest, you become a knowledge base. People are going to come to you because you're a face. They know you. That's cool. That's a community. So, like I said, I did not make this site for my friends, although they benefit from it. I benefit from it the most. I tapped into a community based off of my interest. I made Tumblr, Facebook page, and I posted it on Pinterest. Now, the thing that I like to talk about a lot when I talk about taking your interest to the web is that you can do a whole heck of a lot for nothing. How much does Tumblr cost to be on Tumblr? Someone, just shout it out. It's free. How much does it cost to be on Facebook? Free. Free. How much does it cost to be on Blogspot? Free. <laughs> Pinterest? Free. Um, what else do we have? Instagram. Instagram. Free. Uh, what are some of the other ones? Twitter? Free. YouTube? Free. You can do the live stream. 
You can live stream video. I'm teaching people on the web right now. That's an education. You know how much that's costing them? Nothing. And it's costing me nothing. Well, I drove up here, but other than that, it's costing me nothing to teach them. It's because I'm interested in it. This is an interest. Social media is an interest. And I'm sharing. Oh, great. You're live streaming. That's a Oh, no. They, they might not be able to hear you. The microphone's all over here. But I just want you to start thinking about that. Thinking about if you wanted to get into something, before you sunk money, you want to learn about it, you're going to tap into a community. Maybe someone else wants to do exactly what I'm doing. They like insects. They want to pin them. They come onto my page, they see this. I am now a credible source. They have joined my community. They have liked this. They're going to follow me. It's my interest. It's their interest. We're sharing that. And because I'm on every free available site, I have a presence, and now they're going to come to me. If you can be on a site for free, you should be on there. I mean, if you're a company and you're trying to do social media for that company, you should be on that. You should be on any free site. You should be following trends. You should be on news sites. How many people have heard of the app Vine? Is anyone, you guys, anyone else Vine? So you're, <laughs> um, Vine is like Instagram, but for video. And that's what it is. Six seconds of video. You get six seconds to share something via video. And it loops and it has audio. Six seconds loops. How much do you think it costs to be on a buy? Zero. If you are a company, you should be on buying. Do you want to share the Oreo story? I did before, oh. before you came in. Yeah. So. There you go. It doesn't cost anything to be on. Those companies had a bigger outreach for those on the web. Oreo, when the website, when the Super Bowl went dark. The day it went dark. Um, Oreo, I did, was it a Twitter? Yeah, they posted a photo on Twitter. They posted a photo on Twitter that said, you can even dunk in the dark. Right? Something, yeah. like that. Mm -hmm. Something along those lines. They probably said it better than I did. Um, but they had a bigger outreach than a lot of the commercials did in the Super Bowl because everyone was checking their phones when the game went down. They, didn't call, they, they paid one person to probably sit in a room and to live tweet during the game. That cost? was nothing compared to a multi-million dollar commercial. What's the bigger reach? It's Twitter, and it costs them zero dollars to be on Twitter. If you're a company, it costs you zero dollars to be on Twitter. The other 30-second video that they had probably cost them around $4 million, because so that's what the rate was for the commercial. It's still a great commercial, but $4 million versus that one guy getting paid per hour to sit behind a desk and tweet. It's a no-brainer. You're a company. You're going to go with a website that costs you nothing. So, Upside down umbrella. A couple of years ago, I probably could have bought a web page. I could have bought a domain. Could have bought the URL. I could probably get rid of Tumblr.com, and it would just be an upside down umbrella.com. Do I care? No, because that costs me money. I care that it's free, and that I can reach. It's only. I mean, it's very small compared to other things that people do on the web. It only has like probably less than 50 followers. But the idea is that it's free, and I'm reaching people just by having an interest. All right. So now I'm going to get down to a little bit of the nitty gritty, the kind of terminology that I use when I talk about posting, individual posting, what you write, what you post. It doesn't matter if you're on Tumblr, if you're on Facebook, if you're on Twitter, if you're on Pinterest, if you're on Instagram. These are things that carry across your social media experience, and I think they're very important if you're going to do anything in social media. At all, and you see, even works, even applies for your personal life. So, the very first thing I'm going to talk about in terms of posting elements is a uh, is time frame. When I was posting stuff on an upside down umbrella, I would create a post and then I would just release it. I got a few views, I got a few likes, maybe a comment, and I'm like, where? How do I get more posts? How, I mean, how do I get more likes? How do I get more comments? I started paying attention to when I started posting. Are, my, are people checking Facebook more during the work day, at lunch, in the morning, in the afternoon? Can you be specific? Are they checking Facebook more between the hours of 11 a.m. and 12? Are they more likely to check it between 4 p.m. and 5 p.m.? This is all the information you can gather. Facebook has analytics. YouTube has analytics. Tumblr, if you wanted to. 
you can do analytics. Blogspot does analytics. Twitter doesn't have anything. Uh, you can run analytics on Twitter, but yeah, you can run analytics on Twitter. Twitter. But yeah, so analytics are very important. Time frame is very important. I'll show you an example. Do you want to show the insights? Yeah. On on your. Let me find a popular one. All right. Twenty-four people saw this post. Twenty-four organic. Zero viral. What does that mean? 24 organic. The people who checked my Facebook page for Upside Down Umbrella, they saw an Upside Down Umbrella. No one shared it. It didn't go viral. Viral meaning someone saw that they liked it, and then they saw what that person liked. Or they commented, and someone saw what that person commented. That's immediately viral. I didn't intend for it to go to that audience, but it went to that audience. So but I think you bring out a good point. It's, it's, not a, it's not as easy as you think to make, to make something go viral. It's a, it companies, really takes. Companies think you can go. When I used to do video at, at Penn State, people would go, can you make this go viral? It's a silly question. Can you make something go viral? Can you make this video go viral? I can set it up to be viral. I can make it with viral elements, but I can't make it go viral. I don't have a button. I don't have a link. I don't have a site that I can use. GoViral.com. Someone should make it. Trademark. Copyright. I got it. Um, but you can't do it. It's not possible. Facebook can help you track it, though, and they can help you understand what it means. Viral means when someone outside of your community likes it, posts it, comments on it. Someone from inside their community likes it, posts it, comment on it. Someone outside their community likes it, posts it, comment on it. That's all out of your control. That's viral. Think of it as a Venn diagram, but instead of all of them connecting to you, well, they would all connect to you in a way but you wouldn't be necessarily part of their community. So it's an interesting way to look at it, but time frame is very important. Some of these posts have 25 views, some of these have 21, some people have 32, some of them have seven, some of them have one. It's a trial and error method. Knowing your audience, knowing your community. Now, again, this is all a case study for this individual page, but you probably do it with your personal life, you don't even realize. If you're saying, I'm having a bad day on Facebook. At 6 in the morning, people are going to get a bowl. You were awake for, what, five minutes? You having a bad day? They don't care. You get to 6 o'clock in the evening, and you go, I had such a bad day. Your mom might come and go, oh, honey, what was wrong? Did you have any, you know, was it school? Was it work? Did a bad lunch? Did you stub your toe? Something like that. Your friends might go, oh, I need to ask them how their day was. When you post is just as important to what you it's a big factor that people don't think about. Time means everything. Oreo. Timing. All I had to do was post at the right time, millions of views. Lots of retweets. Exposure. Time frame is a very important element to what you post. How many of you think about when you post something on Facebook, actually think about before you post it on on whether you know whether you're gonna get someone to respond back. I mean, is that why you post it? You post it to get a response back, or do you just post it because you feel like ranting? Um, and that's why you post it. I mean, you may not be thinking about it, but a lot of times you're crafting when you respond to something, not as a knee-jerk gut reaction, but you're responding to it at a very specific time because you expect someone to respond back. But is that uh, this is just a quite general question to you guys? Is, do you really when you think when you post something, do you think about it? That you're posting because you want to get some sort of feedback from people, some sort of satisfaction that, oh yeah, people are actually listening to me? Or do you just post it for the sake of posting because you just want to get something off of your mind? You don't really care who's listening to it. You don't really care if someone will find back to it. So you think about it a little bit on what a you post. Bit, yeah. right. That's a time frame. Not at all. You know, if there's not a time that you would like someone to rant on Facebook, right. that's a time frame. Whenever I first started posting, I would actually, if like no one liked, and this was like a long time ago, now I don't post anymore, but like if no one liked my comments or like my posts, I would delete them. That like get more people to see. That but no did one you ever rewrite it though at another time? No. Uh, see, I, I should have. That would have been interesting because you can test it out. Time frame is very important. Well, I'm going to move on to, or do you have a, I was just going to say like, on people's personal um, social media sites, uh, you're expecting to be genuine, so it's kind of, I don't know, you 
planning out, you know, your posts as much as if, if it was more of a marketing. But you might not think a marketing thing. Thing. Timing is important. Um, yeah. Are you going to write on someone's wall for their birthday? You write it on first thing in the morning, in the evening. Is it okay to do it the next day? Is it okay to do it two days out? Is it okay to do it a week out? <laughs> It's not, it's not necessarily time frame as I'm hoping I'm getting the most response. It's you're doing it because you're getting personal satisfaction out of it. You might think you have the funniest tweet ever. You thought of this joke while you were in the shower. You're like, oh my god, no one's written this yet in the history of Twitter. And you go and you write it. Right? No one responds to it. You're going to feel pretty bad. That's just how it is. Maybe you repost that amount of time. Or maybe you don't do it. Maybe you, you just let that joke sit in your mind a little bit. And you go, I know everyone's using Twitter at 6 p.m. To get the most laughs. So I want to make people laugh. That's the point of it. It's not, I'm getting, I want to get 20 retweets because I want to be a stand up comedian. It's, I want to get 20 retweets because I think this is funny and it will make people say better. It's, it's manufacturing for effect, not necessarily for profit. But I see you what you're saying there, yeah. You get sort of a self, you know, it's self satisfaction. Self satisfaction that people are listening So if you ever want to try this, actually, you can do this. You post between 8 and 10. You more likely get people to comment and like. Um, if you post between 12 and 1, you more likely get people to comment. And then if you post between 6 and 8 in the evening, you more likely get people to comment and like. And those are all, if you think about it, you can look at analytics, or you can also think about it just common sense. Uh, between 8 and 10, or you know, 9 and 10, whichever time frame you want to choose, because when people go to work, uh, that's the first thing that they look at. Uh, you guys, when you wake up, that's probably the first thing that you look at uh, right before you go to class. Lunch. Um, lunch, if you have a phone, you're looking at it. People at work, when they have lunch at between 12 and 1, that's what they're doing while they're eating lunch. Um, and then 6 to 7 or 6 to 8, it's after dinner, that's what people are doing while they're watching TV. They got home, yeah, so, they're unwinding. Yeah, those are all key, those are all key moments. But again, each audience is different, right? If you know your audience and you know your audience doesn't sit down to eat dinner between 5 and 6, then you're not going to post between 6 and 8 because you know that they're not going to get on their phone and watch TV. If they don't sit down on the couch at that time, they might not eat your post. So you know the general time, but you got to know your audience. And we'll get back to the knowing your audience in just a second. Tone. Tone is important. Again, tone is something that applies to this as well as your personal social media. When you write something, and your Facebook, one of your Facebook friends is your mom, you're going to write it very differently than if your mom was on Facebook. That's just how it works. You're not going to be going around talking about what you did on Saturday night's party if you know your mom's going to read it. You might talk with your friends on Facebook going, Saturday was, Saturday was great. It was such a great time. That was such a great party. Keep it very general. If your mom was on Facebook, you might be more specific. Although you guys are very much more conscious now because you know that people are going to check your Facebook if you go for a job. And they do. They trust me. They, they will check your Facebook. You go for a job. They can reach you from there. Uh, Twitter, anything. My friend got fired from an internship because he bad out the company that was he was working in. That was got hired by it, or yeah, hired his company for. Uh, it, was, it was a third party company. It was a third party it's a, company. Yeah, it's a friend that we both have. It's a third party company that did marketing work for a another company. Another company. Can't that, say specifics. And uh, and he was just an intern, um, and something was posted about the process of you know creating a project. Ad, yeah. Um, and the other company actually was doing a search on Twitter about their their brand essentially themselves, and um, they picked it up and. They knew that this, yeah. you know, they contacted the third company that this person worked at, and he I essentially fired. got fired as yeah. an intern. So as an intern, he wasn't. Yeah. He was making that money. He wasn't making money in the yeah. fire. So, but tone is important for a company. The way Coke talks is different than the way Reebok talks or Pepsi or Pepsi. Yeah, even the, even the language between Coke and Pepsi is very different. I make a very conscious decision when I write for Upside Down Umbrella to not be too scientific. It's only interesting to people in my community up to a point. If I get too scientific, you're gone. If I start talking, if I use a lot of lingo or terminology, like, oh, look at that Beatles Elytra, they're quite beautiful. People are going to go, I know what Beatles is, I don't know what Peggy Elytra is. They're going to zone out. They may not like, they may not repost, they may not retweet, they may not 
you know, they might not do a host of things because I lost them. So you've got to practice your tone. Then again, it's a trial and error. You might not know what your tone is. You're bound to make mistakes. You might not pose at the right time. You might not have the right tone. But as long as you know to look for these things, you can change and you can craft a more uh, successful social media post. And actually, I'm going to have you quick do, we'll do it very quickly. Um, I'm going to have you break into two, so just look at the person that's next to you. You guys can just do a quick three. Um, I want everyone to write, and you're going to have to use a computer or your phone or an iPad. Um, write a quick Facebook post, uh, do it Super Bowl related. Uh, if you were code, you do code, uh, you do Pepsi, you do code, you do Pepsi. Just write one Facebook post if you were posting for that company. And you can do it Super Bowl related. So think we're in post Super Bowl atmosphere. Write a post as if you were Coke, Pepsi, Coke, or Pepsi. Okay? It's only going to be five minutes, not even that. Just quick write something. Don't think about it too much. Look to see what their tone is on their Facebook, on their own page. Just quick look it up. And just put it up on the screen. Yeah. Let's go through their Facebook page. Go viral is already taken. According to what's that? Go viral dot com is already taken. Someone wrote that. Oh. <laughs> go viral. That was my that's my cash cow. I was gonna I'm gonna sell go viral, make money. You, you can be that guy. Who just copyrights URLs all day. It's illegal. I know. Is it illegal? It's called domain squatting. People, people still do it. How do they? People still do it, but it's not. I mean, you're not going to get arrested for doing it, but they're going to they're going to take the domain away from you if they find out that you're domain squatting. I mean, you can do it, but you can report people for their domain squatting. You don't get arrested for it. How do I? There's more songs. Yeah. And then you make it smaller. Mm -hmm. and then everything down to the color. That's very For those following at home, we're looking at the Coke page and the, and the Pepsi page on Facebook. Please go to those sites and look at them now and critique the different languages. <laughs> the tone. Now do you think, based off of what you've seen, is that an appropriate time? Do you think someone would be offended by that? Do you think it's just too hard? 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 So is that so you're gonna do a, you're gonna do something in that language, right? So you're going for that language. You know it has to present a voice. It has to present a basic reason why So that's the point. Basically, whereas most commercials they might say they're always making arguments. So this one's a very specific argument. So now you're thinking about that all people need less sugar, want less sugar. Craft something based on that. Think about that so you in your audience. Yeah. Like, what well, you guys got? Well, we were looking at a few of their sites. We noticed that they're like, um, this one's Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 
Because they put a lot of, like, they have, like, the oh my god thing. <laughs> so they're hip. They yeah. Know, they know internet names. Mm -hmm. They know the Herman Gurr. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or the Herman Gurr. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so we were thinking of doing something with the black. Because they yeah. use a lot yeah. of yeah. 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 Okay. That's so you point. know that they're hip, mm -hmm. that they're sarcastic, but they're always positive. Mm -hmm. It's never sarcastic in a harmful way or hurtful way. You use a company, you can hack it. So Herman Gurr yeah. is very borderline like they're making fun of that. Yeah. So they have to use it in a way that's not harmful because they have an ethical and moral. They need to not do that. So think of something that's humorous, sarcastic, doesn't harm anyone, but plays off the Super Bowl play. That, there's your angle. Go for it. I mean, the black guy is Yeah. 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 I mean, like, people just so All right, let's just quick share what you got so that way we can move on. Stand up, I'm gonna point to you, your group, stand up to one person to say what it is, say your say your brand. I don't need to hear an explanation why. I just want to hear it the post. Alright? You guys go first. You got one. He said Alright, everyone, pay attention. Completely exhausted from our group at Fed's next level at There you go. So they're commenting on the halftime show. Because it's brought to them by Pepsi, right? Yeah. Pepsi sponsored the halftime show. There you go. That's in the language. It's topical. We're talking about the Super Bowl. They're pointing back to something that they've already invested money into. Again, Facebook is free. So they're using something free to promote something that wasn't free. So they spent a lot of money on the halftime. Very good. All right, share the next one. All right, um, I just, I wasn't just a cool thing. So talking about Again, they're talking about the blackout. But theirs is a little bit more humorous. It's more tongue-in-cheek. Coat likes to pitch himself as very fun, happy. They got smiles going on, sunsets. Everyone sharing a coat. Grab yourself another coat. It's very in line. What do you guys got? All right, so Pepsi. Um, and we went off with the, if you want, or if you want the same great taste with less sugar, cheese, Pepsi, that. So they went after a very specific market. They know that they have a product, and it needs to be filled by people who want something with less sugar. They know the language. They understand. There it is. And it's, that was how to craft one that's not topical. So it's a very good decision. I think everyone wants to do something more or less topical or something else. But exactly, that's the right language, because you're trying to get the people who want less sugar. All right, next. Um, ours is just like a picture of like the blackout and just saying like 35 minutes and to the whole blackout, like enjoy everything because it's the Luke Zero tagline. There you go. Topical, humorous. Another reason to grab a coat is the blackout. Work in your tagline, it's free. That's all. See what you did there? Everyone look at the language. If you were hired by one of those companies today, they'd ask you to do the same thing. What's the language we're using? Can you match it? Take it to the next level. Tone is very important. All right, we're going to move on to the next thing. Take it back to you when I was going a little slower there. All right, we'll, we'll do a little bit of speed for some of these other ones. Yes, time. Yeah, I just want to. Frequency, actually, let's pick, because that pulls this up. You can see the difference already in one of these, right? Coke, Pepsi. Red, blue. Happy, enjoy, sunset, flower, community. 
Young girls, maybe doing vandalism, maybe doing community work. Don't know. Oh, I'm at a party. I might be tripping. I don't know. Um, I'm blowing. I'm in a pool. I'm riding bike without any hands. Um, drink Pepsi. So, I mean, you can already look at the difference. That's language. Pictures, as you already know, are language. So right away, they've already set the tone for what everything else they're going to say on their page. So that's just something you want to think about. If you're going to do anything like this, if you're going to work for a company, if you're going to brand your own Facebook page like I did for Upside Down Umbrella, I pitched it as something that's very relaxed, non-scientific, artistic. My language, if you go to my page and you look at my Tumblr, oh, that was bad one. Yeah, just do a history. Do a reopen last code window. Did you? I like your style. The first thing you see on my site is you see a font, and you see a logo, you see my tagline. It looks artistic. It doesn't look scientific, does it? It looks artistic. That's my point. When you come to my site, if you can tell what my tone is within the first five seconds, I've done my job. So you know what to expect from here on out. So if you saw this, and you went down, and instead of one sentence, this was a paragraph on the history of this insect, where it was discovered, why it was named, blah, 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 blah. Be bored, because you wouldn't expect that from my page. That's tone. All right. Frequency. How often do you post? This kind of goes in with time frame, but it's also it's a very different situation. Knowing when to post and knowing how often to post are two different things. For Upside Down Umbrella, I post once, if not twice in a week. And if I post once, it's going to be on Monday. If I'm going to post two times, it might be Monday, Friday. If I'm going to do three posts in a week, I'm going to do Monday, Wednesday, Friday. So I want people to do A. I know they're going to check their Facebook because they're going to sit down at work. They don't want to do work on Monday. They're going to check my site. Wednesday, they hit that midweek slump. <laughs> slump. Check my site. Friday, they don't want to do work at the end of the week. Check my site. Have something to talk about on the weekend. I have a very specific plan for how I do it. So all my posts go hand in hand. When I post on Tumblr, it immediately goes to my Facebook at that exact time. So I want them to go hand in hand. But I have a plan in the way I do it. On Facebook, on Tumblr, I post either Monday, Wednesday, or Friday. Facebook, people are checking it more often. People are checking Facebook several times a day, maybe 10 times, 20 times a day, every day. I'm not going to put more information on here. So instead of creating information, I fill in the rest of the time with more posts, other people's posts, other information, other people who are doing photography, other people who are in my field, in my community, who are doing interesting things, I'm posting. Humor, visuals, artistic, I'm doing it. I'm posting other stuff. So I know that in the week, Tuesday and Thursday, I have to go find other stuff and post it. Time frame is important. Are you a company that posts on the weekend? Is someone drinking Coke every day of the week? Are they going to grab a Coke on the weekend? Probably, yeah. So you want to post on the weekend. That is frequency. How often do you post? How hungry is your audience? Will they want a post from your brand every day, every 12 hours, every two hours? Are you going to post too much? Are you going to, going to be distracted because you posted every two hours? Are they going to not want you on their stream anymore? because you post every two dollars. That's frequency. It's a very important part if you're going to try to be successful, especially on Facebook, because you can get annoyed real fast if you post every hour. You have friends like that. Actually, you can get Farmville. People, if people are playing Farmville, you're going to see if someone's getting a new cow every 30 seconds. I don't care. So I don't have friends who play Farmville. <laughs> I just get them off my stream. If you play Farmville, sorry, I don't care. Um, <laughs> But that's, that's called frequency. You don't want to know someone's playing farm bill every 30 seconds. You don't care. Same thing with the company. You want to drink Coke when you want to drink Coke. You don't want them to tell you to drink Coke every 30 seconds. You're going to grab a Coke when you want. The idea for marketing is they're going to coach you into getting a Coke, not tell you to get a Coke. So when you're telling someone to drink a Coke every 30 seconds, your frequency is too high. You need to lower your frequency when you post. 
keywords. And I know Jigger is going to talk about this more in the weeks to come, um, especially with SEO, search engine optimization. I'm just going to quick touch on it. I won't take long because keywords are something that I'm still getting into and I'm still getting used to. Um, and I'll talk about how uh, it can be important for YouTube later. But what you talk about, and again, this goes with your tone and your language, what you talk about is how you're going to get people interested, especially on sites that search your posts. If you're tweeting something, someone can search something pretty much replacing a word in your tweet. So what words you use are going to drive what community you're in. Who's responding? Who's looking? Who's interested? Who's not interested? Again, if I'm using words on an upside-down umbrella, like Elytra, which is the hard shell on the back of a beetle, that might get someone more scientific than if I don't use that word. So is someone going to find me because of the word Elytra, or is someone going to find me because of the word beetle? Two different words. Each is a search word. Each one is important to what audience I'm talking to. And again, that drives your SEO. Who's seeing your page? Who's not seeing your page? And uh, like I said, that's just a little introduction to that. I know Jigger's going to do a much better job. I start to, when I start thinking keywords, I get very bored. It's, it can drive a lot of business. It can drive a lot of views. It can drive a whole audience. Keywords are very, very important, but a lot of it can be numbers, statistics. And that's when I start to jump out. Um, but if you're very good at it, you can get hired just to know the numbers. <laughs> Search engine optimization is a very hot topic right now. I mean, it's all over the place. If you can harness SEO and keywords, then you're doing it right. Yeah, it's essentially tricking. When you Google something, it's tricking Google to put you on the top. Um, is what search engine up there, up there like is. Because the way Google gives you results is based on an algorithm, and they have so many different, uh, they have different uh, things that work behind the bat that tells you know when you type in the word inset, you know what's the best result for you. Uh, it's like taking to different accounts. So if I were to type inset, the chances are because Google knows so much about me, and because I'm tied to Tim through. Google Plus or you know Twitter or Facebook, it's more likely that that result on my page is going to be higher than it is if you know if Ethan was looking for insets on on Google because it does it individually. So the keywords are uh, helpful in terms of what you're looking for and how you're looking for, but you can also manipulate it to get your results up on top. That's why sometimes when you search for something, it's always frustrating because something that is not relevant at all comes up as your first result. It's because they have tricked it to come up as a first result. And so it's an art. Um, it's actually a very upcoming, uh, if you're good at it, it's a, it's a profession that is, is sort of in need. It's hot. It's hot right now. But yeah, Jigger will even he'll go more into it later. Yeah, we'll it's a huge part more. of the web, and especially now social media, because there's so much analytics involved that he'll give you a whole lecture on it. I'm just going to talk a little bit about it, because I don't know much about it. So I'll defer to the, the masters here. Um, so keywords is, is what we just finished up. Let's move on to something that I know a little bit more about, engagement. Now, as, as I go down this list and I bring up more terms, you're going to realize that they all kind of, kind of coexist. So when I say engagement, I'm talking about time frame. I'm talking about frequency. I'm talking about tone. I'm talking about language. I'm talking about SEO and keywords. I'm talking about all of it. Engagement is how do you get someone to like? How do you get someone to comment? And how do you get someone to share? And those are all the big three things that you need someone to do to be successful on social media. You can't do those three things. You're not successful with social media. Now, again, trial and error. You're going to make mistakes. You can do it wrong. You can do it right one day. You can do it wrong another day. It's a moving target, but there are things you can do to get people to be more engaging. Um, again, time of day. People, people are more likely to comment midday and at the end of the day. Not so much in the morning. When you post, creates engagement. But if you make, if you write a sentence, like I wrote, we hope this helps you hold over until spring, and it's a video. What do I expect the person to do that's viewing it? I expect them to read it and watch this. That's not much engagement. But my purpose was just to let people know 
I'm not posting photos right now. It's winter. Bugs don't do well in winter. Here's a funny video. Laugh. Enjoy your day. Now, if I wanted to engage someone, I would say, we hope this holds you over until spring. Here's this video. Have any other funny insect videos? Send them to us. We'd love to share them. I asked a question. So as a person who's reading it, what do you want to do? You want to answer it. If you know a funny video, you'll post it. You'll comment. You'll be like, oh, I know the perfect video for this. And then you'll send it. And you'll share it. So if you're interested in this, this is one of your interests. This is inside your community. And you know the perfect video that I haven't seen yet, you'll share it. That's how you engage. Questions are actually a big way to engage. If you're a company, the normal standard protocol before social media wasn't to allow engagement. You had a print ad. You had a commercial ad. You had a billboard ad. And the idea was, read it, and that's it. You know, it wasn't like, tell us what you think of it. Social media creates this back and forth that didn't exist before. And so now, they have to engage. They have to ask questions. So the way you phrase your question and get that engagement is very important. Because you can also structure how they're going to engage. Um, if you ask a very broad question, you're going to get very broad answers. If you have a specific question, you're going to get very specific answers. Questions are the easiest way to do it. You can do polls. Have you guys ever done a Facebook poll? Like someone might say, I'm choosing between three haircuts. Which one should I do? It's your friend. And you're like, oh, I like haircut number A. I think someone's done that before. Um, I didn't have any good examples besides that. But companies do it. They're like, which actually I think Sheets did it recently within the last year where they said, uh, Sheets said, these are the three print ads or billboard ads we want to do. Which tagline do you think is the funniest? And then you take the poll. They just they're gonna pick the most successful billboard ad by asking you. So you've already seen it, they're gonna pick the most successful one that people like the most, and now it's out on the road, and you feel like you have a part in that because you weren't engaged. You are now a part of the community. Not only do you like Sheets. Like, oh, geez, you just helped them market. I'm a marketing genius. I picked the right one. So they're engaging you. You have a stake. You have a piece of their company with you. You helped choose the next billboard. Uh, was it Pepsi just did the uh, crowdsource entrance to the Beyonce halftime show? You sent in a small video clip, and they built an intro based off of you sending in that video clip. So it's crowdsourced. So, oh, I saw myself for a fraction of a second. You know how many people watch that? Probably because they know someone, or know someone who knows someone, or know someone who knows someone who knows someone that is in that video. Probably a lot of people. That's engaging. That's how you do it. That's how you get people involved in your social media, and that's how you get them interested. You give them a stake of it. You give them a piece. And just to add on to that, a couple other examples. The reason why it works that when you do that, then you engage automatically it's going to show up on your timeline, right? Whether that's Facebook or Twitter, it's going to show up on your timeline as, hey, you voted on this thing. Um, or, hey, you did this on, on this. Um, but the, other, the other, other example is Hawaii Five-0, which I think at the beginning I mentioned that they were doing this first, first of a time with a, based on what votes they got, they were going to do a different ending based on what people voted for. Um, and so they did the same thing there, where they posted it on, on different outlets and then have people vote on it and then that's what they aired uh, as an ending. Um, and then the other thing that I want to mention is, is if you want to look at examples of um, getting your audience engaged, I think Junietta Facebook page does this pretty well. Um, if you look at their postings, you can tell which ones, the ones that are geared towards asking people to engage have a lot more comments than the ones that are Sort of not geared towards that. They're just maybe information, or it's just posted there, um, you know, just so people know. So um, if you go down and see the ones that have most comments on it. You'll see that it's some. It's a question. Either it's either a question that they're asking, or they're saying, you know, give us a feedback on something, or you know, cheer for something. This one has uh, uh, four comments, which is a lot for a post of this size. And here's a question. Here's another question. It's engaging, yeah. Right, you have, you get people commenting on that. Like if you go down to the check out this video of we featuring some special guests on campus, that really doesn't have any comments because you're not really asking them to engage, right? You're just asking them whether you know they, if they like it, they're gonna like it. Whatever they're asking it's them. Cool anything. video, right? But if they think the video is cool, they'll probably just share. If I won't comment and then share, they'll probably just share. 
All right, so now we're going to move on to the next topic. Okay. This is the very, well, we have two more things. Um, this will be very quick. Cross posts are another good way to get audience engagement and to be inside the right community. As an upside down umbrella, I want to find other people who are doing what I'm doing and not steal their audience, but share their audience. They might have, I have under 50 followers on this Tumblr. Another Tumblr has 10,000, 20,000. How do I get on their page and promote myself on their page? Well, you don't want to be blatant about it. You don't want to go on their page and go, look at me, look at me, look at me. You want to go and say, look, I'm a part of this community too, so you contribute. You comment on their page. You submit stuff to be put on their page. I've done this, but Upside Down Umbrella is a very popular Tumblr um, post called um, Bug Girl. She's a studying entomologist in California. Um, she posts insects all the time. She has quite a following on Tumblr. I follow her. And I actually have asked her a question about that, that I didn't know. I'm not a studying entomologist. I asked her a question about beetle larva, and she responded. So I got exposure because I sent my video. I sent my video of the beetle larva. She posted that. And she posted my question, and then she posted my, and her answer. That's exposure. That's inside my community. And that's how you get cross posts. You can do it on Facebook. You can do it on Twitter. You can do it on Pinterest. You can do it anywhere. Retweeting, that's essentially cross posting. Someone else likes your stuff, they're doing it. Or you retweet someone else. You want, if you have a comedy Twitter account, and someone else is a stand up comedian, you like their joke, you retweet it. Say, this is hilarious. And then you send it out to your audience. And then that person's going to know you retweet them. Maybe they like your stuff too, so maybe they retweet your stuff. Cross post. Share an audience. <coughs> Next thing I'm going to talk about, we're actually going to skip the activity for that. I was just going to have you find other pages that were similar to this. Using keywords and community, uh, I was going to have you find other relatable Tumblrs and Facebook pages, but we'll just skip that. Um, branding. If you're going to be on five sites, even if they're all free, brand new. I made this logo probably in 30 minutes in Illustrator. If you don't know Illustrator, find someone who knows Illustrator, have them do it for free. I put this on everything. If I'm posting as an upside down umbrella, the logo's there. Look, umbrella. 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 If I do a video, There it is. Umbrella's patch comes with the umbrella. Starts with an umbrella, ends with an umbrella. So when you see an upside down umbrella, you're going to know it's me. That's my logo. That's my brand. And then when they think of my brand and they see my logo, hopefully they think of my community, of my interests, my tone, my language. They understand. So when they come to this page, and the very first thing you see as a user is that umbrella. You know my tone and language already. Coke and Pepsi did it. What are their two avatars on Facebook? Their logos. Their branding. You need that. If you're going to be on Tumblr, Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, Instagram, you need the brand. You need people to know that this is you. Whether it's a logo, whether it's your face, whether uh, it's some text, connect yourself. Connect everything together. That way people know who you are and what you stand for. And keep it consistent. Start right out of the gate. I, the first thing I did when I wanted to do this was I built the logo. And then I built I did some handwritten text, and that was my thing. Use my logo, use handwritten text. Did it right out of the gate. I've done it ever since. I never stopped doing it. Consistency. And the last thing we're going to talk about in terms of posts is media. Using Facebook and video, or using photos and video, doesn't matter where you are. It's a good way to engage, but there are some important questions to ask when you're posting these things, and I'm sure if you haven't talked about it, you will. Um, copyrights. Who owns the photos? If I post to Facebook, what can they do with my photos? If I post my photos to Flickr, who owns my photos? If I'm posting them on Tumblr, do they own my photos or do I own my photos? These are all important questions to ask. As a conscious user of social media, you should always be asking, who owns this? If it's yours and you made it and you're posting it somewhere, you own it. 
The only one telling you other one. That's not right if anyone's taking your stuff. But you have to tell people that. You have to be aware of it. If you see someone else's photo and you really like it and you want to post it on your Facebook, like this video, I keep the information on there. If you go to Devour and you go to that video, that's who posted that. I'm not doing a repost of a video. Like, that's the video. That person who uploaded it, owns it, they get credit for it. Um, what's the video about? This photograph? This photograph is from Dr. Green. Here's the article, click on it, go to it. That's the source. Know who you're posting, know where it's from, give rights to them. Let them know that you're, if you really want to be specific, let them know that you're using it. That might be a cross post. You're telling someone, I'm using your photo. And they respond, and they go, oh, I like your Tumblr. Mind if I share? Go ahead. See what you just did there? You ask for copyrights, you ask for permissions, you cross post. And the last thing I talk about is for posting is YouTube. You may not realize that YouTube didn't belong to Google before Google bought it. There was a time when YouTube existed beside uh, not being a part of Google. Google bought it. Why is that a good thing? SEO. Google video or YouTube videos get ranked higher on Google than Vimeo videos or any other server or any other video server. If you want your video to get ranked higher, be on YouTube. You have to understand that. That's how it works. So if you know that if your picture is going to get most likely bumped up because you're on Flickr, then you should do it. There's no reason not to be. If your photo is going to be more likely bumped to the top of a uh, Google search if it's whatever reason on Facebook, do it. Or be on all of them. It's the easiest way to do it. But you have to understand how each page works and what your chances of getting the best SEO and search option is. Don't let them take a little stand up right now. Sure. Just quick stand up, walk around a little bit, shake it out, get a drink of water, wake up. If you have any questions, go ahead. This one. This one. This one. This one. This one. And it's tricky. The web makes it difficult yeah. because the web is good at being anonymous when you need to be anonymous. Yeah. Um, but if you, you know, sometimes you don't know. Like someone can take my post yeah. and they can make a whole their own whole Tumblr out of it. I would. Yeah. I mean, unless I was checking my analytics and I saw that my post was being shared on a consistent basis to another Tumblr. Yeah. I don't know. Time, yeah, time could potentially take one of my photos. Yeah. And if they didn't ask me, I wouldn't know. Right. And so I'm and said, oh, this looks like one of your photos. They're in trouble now. Because right. that belongs to me, they didn't ask for my permission. Okay. And copyrights are very true. Yeah. It's, it's yeah, we're going to talk about a little bit about it. But again, I think we're going to talk about Creative Commons specifically.
Um, but a lot of it, a lot of what you post on social media, it's real tricky in terms of copyright because there aren't really laws made up yet. That's right. the biggest hurdle because it's so behind. So what you might consider an intellectual property that that I post on, you know, when I post a photo on Twitter, that's my <laughs> photo. Well, uh, technically yes, but if you posted it on Twitter, so technically Twitter owns it. Right. If you're giving it, when you sign up for it, you sign the terms of services that say you know, that they own your whatever thing you feed and or you know put up. So if CNN uses that photo, because you know, you, you know, the example I can think of is when uh, the plane landed on Hudson River. The first image on Twitter was you know them getting out of the plane or on the wing. That was a that was a, a photo that someone tweeted that CNN never got permission for them uh, yeah. to use it. But, but they, they, still they never used credited it. them either, though, right? They right. Well, they said this was from at you know their username. Um, but they didn't ask. But they didn't ask for permission, so you know you can't really sue CNN for using that because there's no, there's no you know, and by there's nothing that says yeah. that you can you know that they can't use it. So it's really tricky and it's really it's it's complicated um, because because the laws that are written when it was all not all you know different it was written for a different medium and the medium is completely changed. And, so. and to some companies though. If you tell them that this is a photo tweeted by so and so, yeah. they're fine with that. Yeah, they don't see the need to ask for permission because it's a tweeted photo. They're comfortable just giving the person a yeah. shout out. Yeah. Some companies are okay with that. I mean, we'll get into this a little bit. I'm just, I don't have uh, much more to talk about, but the one thing I do want to talk about is a little bit about my time spent working for Penn State and how we had to have the social media plan. And that included a sort of moral and ethical code posting and deleting and all sorts of stuff that came along with having social media and letting students talk, as well as protecting students from outside. So I'm going to start talking. I'm just going to get closed. Okay. So we got past the bulk of it. So the few things that we went over in terms of posting, those are the big things. If you want to create a, a, a successful social experience, whether you're doing it for personal reasons or whether you're doing it for a personal interest, a business, a service, those are all good standards to kind of work by if you want to be successful. Once you learn those things and you practice them, and you can only practice them by doing them. I can tell you theory all day. But once you start using them and applying them, you'll get better at them and then you'll be a better, you'll create a better social media experience. All right, so now we're going to switch gears a little bit, and we're going to talk specifically about YouTube just a little bit. Um, I personally use YouTube for a personal account. This is my personal account. I have animation stuff. I have personal stuff, uh, failed projects from work, things that I think are funny, me dancing in between shots for a video. Um, but then there's also this. This is when I worked at Penn State, I worked for... ASMA Auxiliary, or Auxiliary, and Business Services Marketing Office. We handled a lot of different clients for the university, but I was responsible for all the video work. Now, this is going to sound like a silly question, but it needs to be answered. Is YouTube social media? Would you classify YouTube as being social media? Anyone? Yes. Yeah? Why is it social media? Because you're able to share um, videos and you're able to comment on it and like share your opinions and everything. Sharing, commenting, anyone else? Be able to like interconnect, subscribe to other people's profiles. Subscribe, having friends, having circles, having groups. Anyone else? Yeah, I think some people make videos responding to your videos. Video respond. Exactly. You guys got it. I mean. YouTube, you may not necessarily immediately think of it. Maybe you guys might think of it more. But there was a time when you didn't think of YouTube as doing social media. You thought of it as video share, uh, a host service, essentially. But YouTube quickly became the biggest place to post your videos because they had the community. They have the eyes. They have the numbers. They have the people. You go to YouTube because you want the view. Now, other companies have come about because they fill a very specific need. Has anyone heard of Vimeo? If you've heard of Vimeo, it's probably because you've watched something more on the artsy side. 
Vimeo is actually a very specific audience. They don't have the numbers like YouTube does. YouTube has a, has a broad audience. Vimeo has a very specific audience. If, you're on, if you do artistic work and you produce your own videos, whether they're live action, animated, you might want to be on Vimeo because that's where you might get noticed. You might stand out among other creators. If you want more people to see it, go to YouTube. Or, as I've been saying all night, why the heck not? Be on both. It's free. Post it twice. But it is social media. You're right. You can post. You can comment. You can see what other people are doing. You can video respond. You belong to a community on YouTube. So it's social media. Now, one of the things that I had to do when I worked for, for Penn State was I made the videos, I posted the videos, and then I monitored them. Are they successful? Are they reaching the right audience? Um, are they getting views? Are they not getting views? Why aren't they getting views? Is it on the wrong page? How are they finding it? How are, why aren't they finding it? These are all important questions to ask. But the most important thing, and the more videos we have, the more important it became, is to monitor comments and posts and what people are saying on the video. Now, Jigger told me, you all, you guys already talked about this a little bit, so I'm going to give you a pop quiz. I just need to hear yes or no. I'm going to give you two comment examples I've made up. I need you to tell me whether or not, as a user on this page, if I should delete them from a video. I'll read you the first one. And at the end of it, just shout delete or keep. Okay? Your video is dumb. My little brother can make a better video, and he's still gestating in my mother's womb. Keep or delete? All right, raise your hand if you want to delete it. Why do you think it should be deleted? I mean, what are you trying to do? Are you trying to like inspire more arguing, or are you just saying it? Who says keep? Who wants to say why? You raise your hand for keep. Who wants to say why you want to keep it? Uh, it's funny. I think people will see it, and even if it, even if they agree with the person, even if they disagree with the person, either way, it's really more fun. Okay. Um, and I would say that they're targeting that is uh, transparency, and uh, people buying that over the time you see Everyone who raised their hand for a delete is wrong. Sorry, but you are. It's a person's opinion. They're not hurting anyone. They might be rude. They might be doing it in a very, in a way that might just make you shut down. You might not want to respond to someone who's talking that way. They might be a troll. You guys probably know what a troll is on the internet by this point in your life. A troll is someone who's just there to pick fights. They're not there for any good reason but to pick fights. That's what they want. They want you to react. This one is one you would keep. It may not be the best comment. You may not want it on your video. You may have spent hours, weeks, months on a video, and this is what you get, but you have to keep it. Because there's no reason for you to delete it. But here's the next one. I totally agree with your post about where to get the best pizza on campus. Also, Pizza Critic 101 is a poop-faced Nazi racist liar. Don't listen to his opinions. All right. Who says we should delete this one? All right, got three hands here. Hand, hand, hand. All right, why are, we, why are we deleting it? I mean, it's insulting for one you're calling someone you're accusing them of lying. All right, so it's insulting. You're going after someone in particular for their thoughts. Anyone else, why would you delete it? It has nothing to do with the video. It's to, I mean, it's, I mean it does, but it's just then ignorant. Yeah, it's well, ignorant. It's, it's, comment. it's not really relevant. It was, then it became irrelevant to the top. It's kind of a trick one because it is relevant, yet it's irrelevant. All right. Who thinks we should keep it and why? Uh, that's YouTube, man. <laughs> I mean, if you, if you delete every comment like that, you'll have to scan all of your video, videos all the time. All right. The correct answer is delete. Delete. Why? Because it's insensitive. It's attacking. I would use the word attack. This individual user is going after another individual user for their beliefs, for their, their thought process, for having an opinion. It may not be their opinion, but they're attacking someone. So you have a moral, ethical obligation to delete it. But 
You can't believe it unless you have a social media plan. This is important. As a university, as a marketing office, I represent Penn State. As an employee, I have to represent their best interest. And at most, I have to protect the students, because that's what we're about. We're about education, and we're about students. Now, we had this exact case, not these words, but we had a very similar case. I assume everyone is aware with the going-ons at Penn State within the last couple of years, correct? Well, I had a video. It might have even been this one, but it was about housing. Someone made an inappropriate comment, not to do with the video, but about the current case that was going on at Penn State. We have a social media plan that is present on our page. The following comments are subject to editing or rejection. Comments including blatant profanity, racist, sexist, or derogatory content, product advertisements, political support, comments that are off-topic or spam, comments that are personal attack on an individual. Why do we have this? This lets you know exactly where we stand. If I delete your comment, you know why. These aren't, these aren't like something ridiculous. I'm not saying I will delete your comment if you mention pizza. I'm not saying I will delete your comment if I dislike it, or if it goes against my thoughts or my opinions. I'm saying if you're attacking someone, I have the right to delete it. If you're being racist or sexist, I have the right to delete it. This is a social media plan. If you work for a company, or even if you want to do it on your own page, this gives, this gives you basically, you're saying, this is where I stand on this. So when I delete something, you know why. I don't delete it because I don't like it. That's no reason to delete something. You shouldn't delete something because you don't like something. When you go through life, people are going to say stuff that you don't want to hear all the time. You don't stick your fingers in your ears. Well, you could, but you don't. Because you're going to hear it, regardless. Social media is just a digital version of what goes on in the world. It's just right here in front of you. And it might happen faster than in the real world. It's online. And everyone can see it right away. But when you have this, this is basically a way of protecting yourself. This is important. Social media plans are important to a company. Maybe if you want, you can apply them to your own life. I, I'm just going to reiterate one more thing. Um, this goes back to, if you remember, we talked about mature use of social media. Uh, and and the, the first comment that Tim talked about where it says review is dumb, that's more of a, it's, even though it's not constructive criticism, it's a criticism of one sort. So you know, not deleting that is a good thing because you're being transparent. You sort of you, you're sort of taking their opinion and saying, okay, you know, maybe I spend a lot of hours on it, but maybe this video isn't as good as I thought it was. Um, you know, people on the internet, you have to assume that not everyone is at the same level in education as you are. So they might express a video being dumb as a as criticism that's constructive, but, it, you know, it, in your opinion, it might not be, but it is, in a sense, because that's the internet, right? They're not all college educated educated folks. They're, you know, maybe some of them are only high school educated. Some of them are probably 10 year old kids that's going on and not like your video. Um, but the second comment um, is a lot more, um, it's a personal attack, it, you know, it, it, it racism, it's the it racism, the auditory. There is a lot more thin in there where it, you know, you do have a moral obligation to lead something like that. And, I, and, and you know, if you use the Obama campaign as an example, I'm sure if you looked on there, you're not going to find any racist comments on there because the chances are they have a team of folks that are deleting those comments because that's not, you know, that is derogatory, that is sort of offensive with that, that person. So I think that's, that's good to keep in mind that, you know, even if the comments might not be mature, it doesn't mean that you have to delete them because they're not, you know, they're not at the same level as what you're thinking might be. And it's also, it's a gray area. By having this, you, you have a clear-cut definition of what you want and don't want to see on your site. You know, what someone finds offensive varies. I'm sure what I find offensive is a lot smaller than what someone else in this room might find offensive. That's what this is for. This basically says, we have X, Y, Z, yada, 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 reasons why we can believe your posts. Um, so I can understand my, that it, it went against your policy there, and I can understand why it's a policy to not allow like, racist comments to be made or stuff like that. But supposing that the comment was just insulting another user for a comment that they made, like, 
and express, is you still going to need it? Because that's that's, that's like the real world. That's that's a good question because it is a, it's like I said, it's a gray area. Depending on your company's stance, they may keep it. They might be a little bit more lenient if if they depend on how they critique that other person. You know what I mean? The way they the language they use is very important in that situation. Um, if they if they're criticizing someone other's comment, uh, but they're not doing it in an attacking way, but they disagree. They can, that's fine. But if they if they breach any of your policies or any of your right here, any of these, you can delete it. And it's it's not a matter of right wrong. It's not a black and white issue. It's it's just not. You know? Yeah, I was just I was just wondering like if it was part of your policy that if like a user insults another user that commented on the video that you also delete that or if that's but you answer and say it's a gray, it's a gray area. It, it's it, like I said, it's up to each individual company. It, I mean, it's a great question because you're going that's gonna happen. But if you work for a company, a lot of times you're not making this criteria. This I didn't write this. I got this from our social media page on Penn State. They have a page for anyone who does marketing for Penn State, and these are the standards that they go by. And these are actually these are pretty standard. This is something that most companies write. Because this is pretty much how a lot of people live on. But if you want to be more strict, you can. If you want to be less strict, you can. So I think here's a good example. Um, if you go to, if you open up TechCrunch, and so any actually, you can open up any article. Because TechCrunch doesn't really have a policy. Or if you're up on the top of the top, of you, if you search for Google. Um, just search, yeah, just do a search for Google. They had an article today. Um, maybe it's not showing up. Uh, do Google racist? Do one of these? Uh, these were one day ago, seven hours ago, two hours ago, eight hours ago. Maybe they got pulled. Is Google, um, is Google search for Google's an unintentional racist ad? So it probably is not on. They probably took it down. No, it's still on here. Yeah. Sure? yeah. Okay. Hold on, I will. Send you. Uh, I mean, your question Facebook is still message. a very valid question. Um, the reason why I want to show this is I just want you to read a couple of the comments on there. And what you're talking about, I think, is, is a good point. TechCrunch doesn't have a policy on you know, whether to delete a comment or not. Um, but if you do have a policy, then I think you get a message. If you do have a policy, then yeah, you, you, have a, you can delete it. And your policy can be as strict as you want. Um, but if you don't have a policy, then you're going to get comments like that, and people are going to look at it. But then, people, your readership is also going to realize that people who comment on TechCrunch are people who are, you know, condescending at times or ignorant at times, and you're going to lose viewership. You're going to lose people commenting because they know that they're, you know, whether they're trolls or whoever they are, they're commenting and they're always personally attacking someone. So you can decide whether you want to take that hit. Um, or do you want to get more traffic on because there's a, some actual educated conversation that's going on? So, you know, there's a little white, bit of context white, to white the article. Collar doesn't, that, white collar doesn't mean pe the people are Caucasian. It's, it's going back and forth. And this is, that's technically, it's borderline. Right. It's I mean, the, if you read some of the things on here, you get sort of disgusted with comments that people post. But they don't have a policy of deleting any of the comments. Um, that's OK, but at the same time, I'm a person that's very much interested in technology, but I rarely ever read comments on TechCrunch because really they're, they're not, they don't provide any value. Um, so a little bit of context about this article, it's about Google. Uh, so what Google does is algorithm is, and this is by coincidence, it's not, or, you know, it's not that Google meant to do this, uh, but they have their algorithm set up so um, when it shows ads, it uses people's names to show ads. And it just turns out that some of their ads um, that say, like, you know, Tim Allman's arrested, uh, question mark, um, it turns out that the, the name that they're coming up with are of African-Americans. And so 
you know, Google's algorithm because of this, this, the number of um, arrest records, number of citations, whatever it is, it just turns out that there's a higher population of African Americans that are being arrested. Therefore, Google is ranking certain articles with certain ads higher. People are calling Google search, you know, racist because it's pulling up people's names um, that are African Americans. And so the article, if you go read the comments, are pretty much racist comments, but they don't delete them, even though they should. Even though that, you know, we would think that there were more obligations to delete them. But TechCrunch doesn't think that because, you know, they want to be open and transparent. They want to be the, the folks that don't censor. Um, censoring at times is good. Censoring at times is bad. I think, and we'll talk more about it um, next time we meet because we're going to talk about social capital and, and a little more about social media and culture. And we, we'll talk about how, um, you know, what is moral sort of disappears when it's on the internet um, in terms of commenting, in terms of transparency. Um, so let's just keep that in mind. So I'm just going to go into a few examples of people that I think are doing it. And then I'll just leave you with a few parting thoughts, and then we'll use the last few minutes just to quick do that, uh, that little experiment. Here at the end. First site that I really like, um, and each of these sites I'm going to show you is an example, not necessarily social media, but it's an example of why they're successful. Many people have read a, a cartoon from the Oatmeal. Yeah, yeah, just a few people. It's a guy who knows about comics. He does it for a living now, pretty much. Um, very tongue-in-cheek, very funny, very out there, very weird, very kind of potty humor at times. Um, but the Oatmeal is an example of content is king. Content-driven sites, all he has to do is be creative, and then the people come to him. He has a Facebook page, so if you want to get updated, I'll send it to your face. You know, you can follow it on Facebook, and every time he does a new comic, boop, there it is. But this guy is so popular now that he doesn't live by any time frame. He posts when he is when he's creative. When he comes up with a good comic, he'll post it when he feels like it. He's his own boss, but the content is king. He has a successful model based off of no time frame. He just does it when he wants to. So this is an interesting one to look at. Um, I'm just going to quick run through two more examples. Um, some people might be familiar with this. This is Boo the dog. Her, I guess is a girl. Her owner started taking pictures of her, and as you can see, six and a half million likes later, it's a business. They sell stuffed animals. They sell books. So this is a weird case of step one, take photos of dogs. Step two, become famous. Step three, step four, profit. This is weird. This is all they did. This is how it started. This Facebook page is how it started. It's just a weird example of how you can't control social media sound like this. They, this person, this owner, this dog, didn't know that they were going to go viral. So they, and they capitalized. They made a business out of it. It's weird, but they did it. And the very last one, this is a really another interesting modern model of how you can make money through social media and through web pages. Devour <laughs> is a site where they make zero content. Zero content. But they earn money. Well, how do they earn money? They curate all these videos. They have people who just every day, all they're doing is searching the web for videos that people are going to like and people are going to watch. You might look at this right now. Some of the girls in the room might go, none of these seem interesting to me. Some of the guys might be like, only half of these are interesting to me. Nine out of ten videos I will watch. I am this audience. I love these videos. They're right up my alley. Sometimes I'm the first person to see it because of this site. Sometimes I'm the last person to see it because of this site. I live and die by what's popular on videos on the web through this site. But all this person does is they have Google Guides and they curate videos. They go out and they find the best videos. And the way they make money is they have ads. McDonald's is advertising on their page. Big Mac Sexy Time, that's their ad. It's snuck in there too, all the videos. See how they did that? When you're watching all their videos, boom, 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 you get to here. This is a cool video. You realize you just got an ad. And that happened. That's how they make their money. They curate content. And you can do this on Facebook too. When I was talking about upside down umbrella, 
On the days when I'm not posting my own content, I'm curating. I'm taking links, photos, videos from the web that I think are interested inside my interest, and I'm posting them. That's curating. Now, I'm not making money off of it, which I was, but this company is. They're making money off of just being a curator. So I'm going to go over my final thoughts, and then we'll split into groups, and we'll just do a quick version. Um, I'm just going to leave you with a few thoughts. Like I said, you can only learn by doing. So if you want to be successful at working in social media, if you want to be a better poster, you want to maybe work for a company someday doing social media, or if you practice social media like I do, I don't work for a company, I just do social media every day because I want to, you might get hired because you are a videographer who also do social media. You might be hired for a company because you are a stand-up comedian who can also do social media. You might be someone who works with cows, but guess what? You do social media. You've practiced. You've taken a class. You put that on your resume. You put that on. Write about it in your cover letter. It's it's marketable. People want journalism. That's all journalism is these days. It's social media for the most part. If you're telling a story. You can't just sit on that story. That story has to go out. That's social media. Make mistakes and learn to leave a project when it's done. I'm going to show you a project I failed. What are you trying for this? Do you blog? I was on that page. Yeah. All right. This I set up on Blogspot. It's nothing special, um, or it's not anything special. But I would take things like I just made an awesome cup of hot chocolate. There is only one way to make a better cup of hot cocoa. And that way is, let's get this into the But it's the clip from the Simpsons movie, where they cannot go. It's just something I associated with drinking out cocoa, is that movie. Um, if I have any songs, my own personal theme song, it would be Flash Gordon theme song. That's not going to do this. I don't know. That'd be my own personal thing. So. But this, this blog wasn't interesting. No one was following. I learned a lot by failing. Don't be afraid to fail. But if you fail and no one's going to this page, nah, forget about it. Go on to your next project. Do your next project. Just forget that this ever happened. But take your failure as a reason to be better the next time. I mean, and you will. I mean, you fail a lot. That's just the natural progress of life. I mean, you're not going to succeed at everything you do. I have a bunch of different blogs here and there, different tumblers. You know, I jump around. You just got to fail sometimes in order to learn what you're doing wrong. And the last thing is, or there's two more things. One is to keep and follow your interests. You may not know what a lot of your interests are now, but as you learn them, Keep up with them. Follow them. And actually, it's a weird way that it works. I, my interests have kind of worked together, and I've kind of made a path out of it. I got started here. I was in computer science. I went from computer science to digital media and film. I went from that into animation, kind of got into puppets. Don't know, weird break, got into insects. Went back to puppets. And now I'm kind of blending all those things together. So when I think of puppets, I think of animation. But I also think of physical puppets. Do I want to make insect puppets? Yeah, that'd be cool. Do I want to film all this? Do I want to blog it? Do I want to, do I want to do social media for it? Yeah. So every time you have a new interest, you can combine it with another of your interests. And that's what makes your interest so specific. So you can find someone else who's maybe interested in bug puppets. That's what social media is for, to find those other people that are interested in bug puppets and do it. And the last thing I'm going to leave you with is, the best advice I can give to anyone who's in digital media or in social media or just in, interested in constant learning and being educated is to consume and to consume a lot. And when I say consume a lot, I'm saying read a lot of books, read a lot of magazines, read a lot of blog posts, 
watch a lot of movies, watch a lot of videos, watch a lot of TV, watch cartoons. Well, I don't want to tell you cartoons are bad for you. They're good. Um, just look at a lot of art. Go to museums. Look at it online. Every day, I'm on Pinterest. I go to the art section, and I just scroll. 10 or 15 minutes. <laughs> I've seen a lot more art that way than I've seen in my classroom. Now, it's uncontrolled. I'm just seeing a lot of art. But I'm absorbing it. Be hungry, consume, find stuff that you're interested in, and go after it and learn. I learned a lot about insects, not because someone taught me about it, because I got interested in it, and I went out and found information about insects. Be hungry, consume a lot. And I lied, there's one more thing. It's don't be, don't be discouraged if someone else puts your idea out on the internet before you do. There are so many people on the internet today that you may find someone else has taken your idea and put it on the web first. Don't be discouraged. This happens all the time. I get discouraged all the time. I think of these cool art projects, and then I'm on Pinterest the next day, and someone's done it, and I go, ah, should have done it first. But, but now you've seen someone who has done it, and they probably failed a few times. So now you take what they've done, and you build off of that. Don't worry about it. If someone else has taken that idea, Keep going, keep pushing, go further, consume more, and keep making.